Hello everyone and welcome to the first of our quarterly genealogy workshops. I'm Heather Registers Abendon, the Outreach Coordinator for the Bobby L. Roberts Library of Arkansas History and Art. The Roberts Library houses the galleries at Library Square, the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies, and the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. The CALS Roberts Library Research Room is open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. for genealogical research. No appointment is necessary. You can also contact our genealogists at arcinfo at cals.org. That's A-R-K-I-N-F-O at C-A-L-S dot org. And I'll put that in the chat um, after I'm off here. In the past, the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies has hosted an all-day genealogical workshop in July. But due to COVID-19, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we were forced to cancel last year's event. So we decided to go, um, go on and do a series of quarterly genealogical, genealogical workshops in 2021. Genealogy is something we pride ourselves on at the Central Arkansas Library System. In addition to the genealogy services at Roberts Library, we offer a number of databases, including uh, Ancestry, Heritage Quest, Fold3, and my favorite, the fire insurance maps. We also offer monthly workshops or monthly workshop Finding Family Facts on the second Monday of the month at 3.30 p.m. You can go to robertslibrary.org for more information. Today's speaker will answer questions at the end of the session. Please type your questions in the chat box in Zoom. Now to today's program, Back by Popular Demand. Juliana Zooks has, was our speaker in 2018, and you asked that we bring her back. Juliana has been working for Ancestry for more than 23 years. She began her family history journey trolling through microfilms with her mother when she was 11 years old. Juliana lectures regularly at national and local events and is an instructor at the Midwestern African American Genealogical Institute. She has written many articles for online and print genealogical publications, and she holds a certificate from Boston University's online genealogical research program. So everybody, please give a warm virtual welcome to Juliana Zooks. Hi, thank you all for coming. Are you, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Welcome, just, uh, welcome everyone to Hidden Treasures on Ancestry. Um, this is one of my favorite classes to teach because not only am I going to look at some of the, some records that you probably are familiar with um, and kind of remind you that they're out there, but also I want to show you some, um, oh, hang on a second. I have to start my video. Here we go. Um, anyways, uh, so I want to. I'm also going to show you some other uh, collections that you may not be familiar with. Um, some like hidden treasures, actually. <laughs> anyways, so I want to start though with some that you are familiar with. We're all we've all probably used census records so many times, but one of the things I like to remind people is that with the ready availability. As, as Heather mentioned, I used to go through microfilm. My mom actually had a microfilm reader in the basement. We were the only people on the block with that. <laughs> uh, but when we were little, we used to have to order microfilms from the Family History Library. And so she would order them and she would put them on the microfilm reader downstairs and she'd go through them, but she would have my sisters and I double check. And we would have to go through and she would have a list of surnames. And for every one of those surnames we found, if we filled out a card appropriately and put our source information on it so she could find it again, we would get a quarter for each card. So she was bribing us early and it worked because I became hooked. <laughs> but anyways, but the nice thing about that is when you're going through the microfilms, you're, you're getting to know the neighborhoods, you're getting to know your people, you're looking at, when you find a record, you're looking at every detail on that record. You wanna see, you wanted to grab every little thing because they were hard to come by. We were looking through Brooklyn for people named Kelly and Miller. 
So once you found one of your ancestors, it was like, okay, let's get everything we can out of this. But now we have so many records at our fingertips. Um, it's real tempting to just kind of, oh yeah, there it is. And then I call this over here, I call this the something shiny pain because I see this census record and I know it's that Catherine Dennis is mine, but it's like, but then I'm like, oh, but there she is in 1910 too. I want to attach that too. So you start clicking and attaching. And before you know it, it's part of your tree, but you really haven't absorbed all the information that you can get from that record. So I always encourage people at the beginning of this class to please go through, look at everything that's in that record, because this is what it looks like when you put it into the tree. Residence, where they lived, uh, sometimes you'll get a relationship to the head of the household, not a lot of info. We all know there is so much more on that 1910 census than this. So make sure that you go through and extract all the information. I still like to do a lot of stuff old school. And to me, it helps me when I like download a blank form and then I fill in, like I because it makes you look at every single one of those columns on that census record and say, what does that mean? You know, oh, look, they couldn't read or write. Or look, he was unemployed for three months that year. But different things like that, those other columns that we kind of tend to dismiss, you know, in favor of the age, birthplace, and the basic vital information. Look at all those columns because that's where the stories of your family live. And when you get find that information, you can go in and fill. You all you have to do is hit this edit button on Ancestry, and you can go in and edit and find add that information that you found. Like for example, if I just looked at that index for the di an index for the Dyer family, I wouldn't realize that they were in the same household as the donors. They were it was a separate household, but in the same building. And so I, I wouldn't have realized that if I hadn't looked at that image. Um, I can also combine information that I found in directories because 1870 doesn't give us an address. Now I have addresses. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do with this. People, I have um, ancestors, I, I'm sure you probably do too, ancestors whose ages change seem to, you know, their date of birth seem to change with every census, right? So you can do some analysis in there too. Say in this record that says he was this age, this record he was this age. You can do a lot of things with this little box here of the description. So take advantage of that and make sure you're getting the most from all those census records. And what I like to do is also start a timeline. Um, putting your ancestors' lives in context is really important. And when you look at one record in isolation, you're not really getting that context. You're not getting all that historical. So you can start with just one record. This is a 1930 census for my great grandparents. And just with this record alone, I can give you all of this. We can add all of this information. We've got birth dates and places based on their ages and the places of birth that we get in the census. Of course, we know where they were living on April 1st, 1930, because this is the 1930 census. And we even have an address here. So this is all helpful information. But as we start compiling it with other information in the census, um, we have an age at first marriage. So we can say, okay, we can estimate, do the math and say, okay, they were married somewhere around 1904. Um, and then as you keep going, you can keep adding on information. Uh, there's, uh, it asks what date they immigrated. So I can say, okay, they immigrated in 1903. So they were likely married here in the United States. And that's where I'm going to start looking for that marriage record. So there are a lot of things you can glean as you start adding all these details, as you look at every single field in that census, you can start adding all the information. And as you think of the power, okay, that was just one census. Now, as you add on the 1920, 1910, you start going backwards and you keep adding on information. You can layer on all these other pieces of information from the other censuses and build on that timeline and really get a fuller picture of their life. Um, layer on historical events, World War I, um, Civil War maybe, whatever the era you're working with. Um, putting on those historical events, things that may have happened in the area where your ancestor lived can help you. But always keep, what I like to do too, is as I'm doing these exercises, keep a to-do list on the side. 
because you're always tempted. I know I am. I, I'm always tempted to like, oh, I got to go look for that marriage record right now. And then I kind of pull myself away. I like to keep a to-do list on the side, write down all the things I want to do when I'm done. And then, you know, finish going through that record and really get all that information. Because otherwise, once you put it in your tree, a lot of times we don't go back and look at it for a very long time. And we're missing those details. Sometimes the answers to our genealogical questions are laying right there in front of our face. It's just that we haven't opened up that record and really absorbed all the information from it. Um, I know you, you've probably been to a million talks where they you know, have told you to cite your sources. It's how important, and it is. You wanna be able to go back to that source. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be the perfect citation. You just need to be able to get back to that record. Um, I like to create, like uh, before I, I, I've gotten a little bit better at citations, but before I was good at it, I would create templates for each census and say, okay, now I just have to fill in all the little pieces, what page it's on, you know, what, where it was at, all the, the little details. So it makes it really simple to just kind of fill in the little pieces that are missing. And then you can paste it into a, a timeline and do whatever you want with it. But I found these are very helpful tools for getting to know my ancestors and seeing their, their story unfold before me. Um, again, I mentioned browsing through an ancestor's community. Thing we have to remember is a lot of times people, when they migrated or immigrated, they wanted to settle with people that they knew, people from the same places they were from. You know, a lot of times there's extended family living nearby. So make note of the people nearby. If you look, this is from uh, Chicago, 1940. And you can see all of these people in this neighborhood from Mississippi. This was part of the Great Migration. But looking at um, one family here, you can even see where they were in 1930. And we have a more specific location in Mississippi. So, you know, if they're, you, if the Williams maybe uh, extend, you think maybe they're extended family from your, your ancestors, then maybe you take a look and start looking at Monticello in Mississippi and see if your ancestors were somewhere in the vicinity as well. It, it can be a clue. Um, also, we have at Ancestry, we have mortality schedules. Now, these are not all exclusive, but one thing to keep in mind is that mortality schedules named slaves before emancipation if they died within the census year. So you can see here, um, this would be an S uh, denoting that that was a slave. And you can see that we have first and last name there. Um, and then the Fs would be mean that someone was free. So you may find free people of color, you may find slaves, um, white people, obviously, but you're going to find everybody on these mortality schedules. And again, this is an 1850 schedule and where we're finding um, a number of slaves that are named with both first and last names. So this is a really valuable resource um, that shouldn't be overlooked. And mortality schedules sometimes don't hit very well. So it's something you want to go after. You want to go look for it. Um, and even if your ancestor didn't die within the census year, you can find out a lot of information about what was going on. What it sounds really morbid, you know. And genealogy, who who but a genealogist wants to know what everyone was dying from in the neighborhood? But it's important because remember, um, a lot of times when there was an epidemic of some sort, people sometimes if they had the wherewithal or somewhere to go, they would leave. They they would get out of the cities or the places where they thought where you know this disease was running rampant and they would get out of the out of the way of it and try and keep everyone safe. Um, this is from Brown County, Minnesota. And you can see all the kids that are dying from diphtheria. And like the ones in green are things that maybe might've been diphtheria, but just were misdiagnosed. So you have, um, but you look at the ages of these and they're all kids. And I, if you can imagine, even if your ancestors or their family wasn't impacted, you can imagine the fear knowing that all of their neighbors' children were dying of this disease. So important uh, historical context to know about what's going on. Um, we also have non-population schedules. Um, we have schedules of agriculture, what? industry. I'm sorry, I have dogs and they're going to misbehave once in a while. Lydia, be nice. <laughs> um, we have schedules of agriculture, industry, manufacturing, and then the social statistics are more, again, historical context, what newspapers were in the area, uh, those types of things, um, churches, um, all kinds of things about what was in that community. 
Um, as far as the schedules of agriculture, industry, and manufacturing, uh, agriculture schedules, I think, are probably the most commonly used ones. Um, but industry and manufacturing are, have, include a lot of similar things. The thing with the agriculture schedules, you're going to see that they own or rent their land, um, acreage, value of land, livestock, and machinery. So you can kind of know how, how they compare to their neighbors, um, what kind of costs they were incurring, what their income was, uh, the number of working and producing livestock, as well as how many were lost to weather, disease, and other things. And we don't think about that, you know, if, a, a farmer has a really bad year, that could really impact their livelihood. And then how much in the value of each crop that was raised. And what's really great to do is if you can compare between the decades, you know, especially between like what happened in between 1860 and 1870, you know, during the Civil War, how did that impact the family? You wow. know, did that help their help them economically or did that hurt them? So you, you've got to look at all these things and all of this as you compare and contrast what they looked like before, you're going to see uh, a lot of differences and you're going to get that story that you're looking for. And the manufacturing and industry uh, schedules are also similar. You can see, you know, what did they own? What kind of materials did they have on hand for their business? Um, how did they compare, you know, if maybe they made saddles or something like that? And how did they compare with other people that made saddles in the area? Um, and uh, for example, and some of the things you'll find, I've got ancestors in New York City, in Manhattan, and they had goats. <laughs> it was like, okay, that's something I would have expected, but that's something you can learn from these schedules. Um, this is an industry schedule from Mobile, Alabama. And you can see again here, you've got um, this guy was a baker. Here's his capital invested, the quantities of flour he had. Um, how did he power it? It was hand powered. So this was all a manual thing. Uh, he made bread. So there's a lot of things and now you can go and look and see, okay, how did he do in 1860? You know, how did he do in 1870? Now, again, these are, we don't have every single schedule. So in some cases, this isn't going to be possible, but in a lot of cases it is. You're going to be able to compare them from decade to decade and see how they fared. State censuses are another great resource for us. Um, I don't know if any of you have ancestors from Iowa in, in 1925. This is what we like to refer to as the mother load. <laughs> um, this census asks for their name, relationship to the head of household, uh, color, age, marital status, home ownership, and also the value or rent that they were paying. Uh, the value of their home or the rent, citizenship, number of years in the U.S. and number of years in Iowa, which is really helpful when you're trying to track migration, um, their education level, their literacy. That's just page one. On page two, we've got a place of birth. We have the father's name, the place of, his place of birth and age, the mother's maiden name, her place of birth and age. That alone right there is just a gold mine. And then also where the parents were married. Page three gives us military service, uh, also what state they enlisted or were drafted from, occupation, any how many months they might have been unemployed that year. Think about the impact that would have had on the family, as well as a church affiliation. So being able to identify their religious affiliation is going to help lead you to some possibly some more records. Um, when we were taught, I was talking about some of the rich records that we have. We have U.S. Tennessee Valley uh, Family Removal Population and Readjustment Case File. That's kind of a mouthful. Um, one of the things that happened as part of the New Deal is the Tennessee Valley Authority, and they were starting to build hydroelectric dams, and they were um, making a lot of changes. A lot of places, as they were building these dams, a lot of communities were flooded out. So they had to relocate people. So they put out these questionnaires. Now these records do not surface very well because it, it's really, they vary. So it was really hard to index more than just like a name. And sometimes, it, you know, you had to go in and try and dig for an age. So a lot of times you're not gonna find these in hints. You wanna go out and seek these, this collection out if you think your family it was impacted by them. Um, and then go in, go out and look for those. Um, this is one example for Murphy Allison and his family. No one had an education higher than fourth grade. 
Uh, it tells us that Murphy had gland trouble. They had 17 acres of plow land, five acres of pasture, and 15, 18 wooded acres, two horses or mules, and 50 chickens. Um, the condition of their farm building was good and their house was fair. So you find out all these details about the family. Um, this is another one, incredibly detailed. Uh, this is for Jim Henry Davis and his family. Um, he was two miles from elementary school, seven miles to the high school, one mile from church. The store was two miles away and they went about four times a month. Um, they likely would have walked. They rented a frame home with no tub or with a tub, um, no water though. So they had, would have had to bring the water from a spring that was about 300 yards from the house. There were no toilet facilities inside or out. Um, wood fireplace heated their four room house among their personal possessions was a guitar and a sewing machine. Their church preference was Baptist and James was a farmer who occasionally worked in timber. I don't know of many collections that will give you that level of detail about a family. And this is just, that's just the first page again. Um, this page talks about his landlord and then he was a sharecropper and it lists the acreage of the different crops and the livestock he owned. He had four cows, five hogs, and 42 chickens. His expenses for 1934 were $186.50, $186.50, and receipts totaled $278. That's for the entire year of 1934. And they had a pretty, um, they had four boys and five girls, so nine kids. That's what they had to live on. Uh, but it goes on and li lists the goods that they produce for family use, um, other expenses that birth, marriage, educational information on the parents. Uh, it even said, tells us that um, five of the chill kids had the chills last year. So um, there's a little bit more detail about their health. Um, that also gives the ages of the children, education. This is another page from that same file. Um, and while this family wasn't selected for sure, they were definitely interested in moving and they were cooperative. And if, ne if necessary, they wanted to stay near their community. So they, they may have had family members there or something like that. But you can learn a ton from these records, but it's something that you've got to dig deep for. And I'll talk a little bit more about how you can find these unique collections in a bit. In fact, in a minute. <laughs> Um, let's talk about vital records. These are kind of a cornerstone of family history research. We always want to dig out the vital records wherever they're available. Um, we just updated, uh, or there's, you want to dig deep for some of these collections. And the best place to do it is to click on the search tab up here in the top. Um, when you click on that, you're going to be taken to this page. And down towards the bottom, you'll find this map where you can click on a particular state. And from there, like here, this is one for Illinois, you can click down here to view all of the birth, marriage, and death records. It look, see, even though there's only five here, there are actually 21 collections that relate to birth, marriage, and death records on ancestry for Illinois. And so once you go in, you'll see a page like this that lists all of the collections. And you can even go down to the county level too. And that's important too, because a lot of times you'll find unique County records. This is for Cook County, which includes Chicago. Um, you'll see all these different Cook County records here um, that are just specific to that county. So you, I would check both on the state and the county level and see what's available because a lot of times you'll find you may find a statewide index and then you might may find the actual records are available on the county level. So it depends on you know where you're looking, but always check both places. Um, Find a Grave is another fantastic resource for, um, for looking for vital records. And you want to take some of this, some of the stuff. Remember, this is entered a lot of times by individuals who have gone to the cemetery. You know, they may have read the stones, or maybe they're, you know, working with information they have on their family. Take it with a grain of salt. We always want to, you know, use some backup supporting evidence, whatever we're using user-generated content, because our errors can creep in. Uh, but this is a fantastic research. This is one of my ancestors. And we had ordered, um, like back in the 70s, my mom had requested the records from the church cemetery. And it listed all the people that were buried in a particular grave site. And we, so we had a lot of the names of the people that were buried in this site. But what we didn't have was the image of the tombstone. And one of my cousin's wife had gone out and taken a picture of it. 
And when we saw this come up, one of the things we had never noticed is that it said, and this didn't come in in the letter from Holy Cross, is he was a seaman and the USS Fort Jackson. And we we're like, what? We had no idea we had a Civil War sailor in our tree. And once we figured that out, I went and looked for the file. Well, it turns out he had enlisted under his mother's maid or his mother's maiden name because he didn't want his wife to find out until after he was gone, which is kind of an interesting part of the family story. You wanted to kind of be a fly on the wall when that conversation happened afterwards. Because basically when in her file, because um, his wife is the one that filed for the uh, a pension. And when I found that on fold three, it was 123 pages long because they had to prove that Thomas Moore, who enlisted, was the same guy as Thomas Howley, who was, you know, that that was the name that he went by. And so they had to prove that this was the same person. So there's all these affidavits in there that are full of information, how he met his wife, what tattoos he had all kinds of details. Jane even put in there that she thought his tattoos were stupid. <laughs> so you get a little insights into their personality too. But that whole story of she had, the, she found out that her husband had enlisted when somebody came, said, here's some money because he enlisted. Um, he took a bounty to enlist and, because he was out of, out of work. And so they brought her some money and they brought him her his civilian clothes and said, He's at the Brooklyn Navy Yard if you want to go say goodbye. So again, would have been interesting to be a fly on the wall for that conversation. She was, she said, I was not pleased in the, in the thing. I think that would probably be an understatement. Um, religious records can also open up some doors, especially because of the fact that a lot of times they predate civil registration. So if you're looking for vital records and they only, they didn't start until later, consider looking for religious records because sometimes they can give you some insights that you're not going to, that may not be available via civil routes. Um, we have this, this is just a sampling of some of the collections, religious records we have. I would look for a, a location, um, search for a location of the card catalog, and then maybe enter a keyword of Catholic or uh, Methodist or whatever religion you happen to be looking for. But um, right now we have, uh, this is a sample from our Toledo Catholic Parish records. Uh, we have collections from Boston, Colorado Springs, Pennsylvania, uh, Canada. We have the Druin collection, which is really interesting. A lot of people look at that and go, oh, it's all French. But actually, you're going to find a lot of Irish people in there, too. A lot of Irish Catholics in the Druin collection as well. Um, we have some fantastic religious records from Ireland, Mexico. Um, there are some other... Um, Caribbean countries now that we're starting to get some records from. So go out there and check and see. Um, one of the things you want to look for, though, too, is think about how the records are formatted. And we'll talk about that in a second as well. Um, we have U.S. Dutch Reformed records on Ancestry. Um, there are a number of different collections. Um, you want to go seek out all the different ones and see where what the coverage is for each one. Always look at the descriptions when you're going directly to these. We tend to go for that search box at the very top of the page. But if you scroll down, you'll see the description for that collection. And that's going to give you coverage information. Sometimes you'll find tips for how to use the collection, how, ways to search it. Um, if it's an index, you may find information on how to request a copy of the actual record. So a lot of great details in those descriptions that you don't want to overlook. Um, this is another collection, Swedish American church records. Um, we've got three different, at least three different ones. There may even be more now, but we're continuing to add to these religious collections as we go. Um, this one here, you could see it gives us, this is actually the whole family. And you can see the different birth names, when they were baptized. Um, a lot of times you'll see when they came and left the church, like if they, when they arrived and were admitted to the church, and then you'll see another notation when, you know, if they left and moved on to another place. So here again, you may find a little bit of a clue to their migration pass if this is a family that moved from place to place for a while. Um, this is another register here. This is that same register. And you can see um, they tested people on their knowledge of and their understanding of the church. Um, this tells us when they arrived in America, when they arrived in this place. 
So, and then where they were from here again, the migration path, finding that out is really helpful. We have United Methodist Church records. Um, here again, you've got a record of all the baptized children, um, all the different places. And then it says the above records were taken from the certificate of baptism. So they're kind of compiling these records and you get a little bit of a, a gist of where they're coming from. But we have these for Illinois, Missouri, Indiana. And I believe we've added New Mexico since here too. Um, we have Presbyterian church records. These include 38 states, baptism, marriage, death, and membership records. Um, the membership records are the ones that you're going to see where you're going to find all these different, you know, when they left and when they came in. But here again, received when and how they came in. This is when they came into the church. Um, this abbreviation, we'd have to look up and figure out how what that means. But here's the names of all the people and in full. We have a huge collection of Quaker meeting records. And if you have Quaker ancestors and have researched in these, you know how amazing they are. They kept very, very detailed records. You could find it again when they came to a, uh, join the meeting, when they left the meeting, um, sometimes why. And sometimes those can be interested. Did they leave of their own accord or were they kicked out? Um, so you can find a lot of interesting details about the family story in these records. Uh, oh, and when we uh, also on these special collections that we have, I want to point out whenever you land on one of these pages, like the collection pages, look for a research guide because we've tried to put together research guides to help guide you through the intricacies. So if you've never worked with Quaker records before, we have a pretty lengthy research guide that will help you get started in those type of records and explain them to you. Um, same with our Jewish family history collection here. Uh, you could search from uh, all of our Jewish records from this form here, and this is going to include immigration records as well as Holocaust records, uh, records from the U.S. and from Europe. Um, there's some aid association records in here, uh, a ton of different types of collections that we've partnered with Jewish Gen and a number of other uh, Jewish organizations. Um, we've also partnered with the U.S. Ho United States Holocaust Memorial Museum for the World Memory Project. And this is a volunteer project. If you wanna give back a little bit, you can actually go in, um, download a tool and you can up, uh, go in there and start indexing some of these records and help once, once you index them in the World Memory Project, all of the indexes that we create from these records are free. The images will not be available on Ancestry, but once you find that record in the index, you can write to the US Holocaust Museum. And what they'll do is they'll send you a copy of that record for free. They just, out of respect, they don't want these record, the images online. So um, but really fantastic resource. And again, if you wanna give back, you can download the software and go in and key some of these records. Um, they're, they're very moving and heartbreaking. I've done a few of these and, um, it's, a, it's an, a very moving experience to do that. So I recommend it. Um, again, we talked about getting to know the records. Um, uh, the Catholic records, a lot of times you're gonna find them in other religions as well. You're gonna find that some of them are based in Latin. And that's something that we notice right off the bat here. See all the first names are in Latin. So that's how you may wanna search for those names. I always try to go out there and do a search for a common name, look and see how they're formatted and try and get some clues. Another thing you want to look at too is, in this case, we've indexed the father and mother on these records. So what you can do, and what I like to do, especially I, I've used these Irish collections uh, pretty extensively, I go in and I'll search for the parents' names and make sure that I can capture all the children, because there may be children that died young or you know a sibling that I am not aware of. So you can go in and capture more of the records as if you go in and just search for the parents' names and see if you can find all of the kids that were born to that couple. Um, we have a really great collection of military records. And of course, there's also Fold 3. Um, one of the most common ones that uh, we see is the World War I draft registration cards. More than 24 million men were required to register for the World War I draft. Not all of them served. Just because they registered it, you know, they just 
that doesn't mean that they were called up for the draft. But you can find out a lot of great details in there. Uh, where were you born? It's, um, this one, this gentleman was born in Madison, Tennessee. A lot of times, for and remember, immigrants were required to register as well, even if they weren't citizens. So you can find birthplaces in the old country, and some two, I think two of the three forms have the birthplace. One of them does not. But you could go in and find maybe their birthplace in the old country. You've got dates of birth. And this information was given by the person themselves. So you're going to be getting, you know, firsthand information as best as they knew it. Um, this gentleman's occupation was the grave digger and tells the cemetery he worked at. Um, he had a, a father, mother, wife under 12. He was, he was taking care of his wife and niece. Um, he was married. He was African-American. He, um, it gives us a physical description over here. And again, there were three different draft cards that were created. They contain slightly varying pieces of information. So you may see something slightly different than this. But at the same time, you're going to find some really great information. And I always encourage people to go after not just your direct ancestor, go after their siblings, too, because maybe, you know, one of one, uh, this one sibling or your ancestor's card doesn't have all that detail where his brother may have a lot of detail on his card. Um, we have World War II draft registrations. There are the old, there's the old, what they call the old man's draft, which was really not a draft. They were more taking a survey of um, who was available on the home front, uh, what kind of manpower we had available here. Um, so that's an interesting collection to look at. A lot of times you'll find the same people in the old man's draft as you find in the World War I draft cards. Um, there may be additional information. Again, here you've got place of birth, their age, date of birth. Name and address of someone who will always know you. Super helpful. And then, of course, the, you know, always ask, I love looking at people's occupations. It always interests me. Um, also, there are all, um, there are more, there's more information on Fold 3. We have the Young Men's Card Draft. We have all of these cards now are available on Ancestry, um, except for Maine. Maine's cards were uh, destroyed before they were able to be filmed. So those are not available to anyone. Um, but we also have U.S. World War II Army enlistment records. Now, these are just a, um, it's not an image of the actual record. It's kind of an index, but it's a very comprehensive index. So definitely worth a look. Um, the 1890 census, we all know, uh, well, most of us probably are aware that, um, that most of the 1890 census was, or everything except for 6,000 plus records were destroyed as the result of a fire. And they were necessarily burned, but water damaged, and they were just taken out and destroyed. But 1890 veteran schedules survived from Kentucky through Wyoming. So if you're A through Kentucky, um, you're out of luck. There are also some selected uh, military posts that are available, but these are fantastic records. If you've ever tried to order um, a Civil War pension file based on the Civil War pension index, especially if you're looking at common names like my ancestors were, had, tend to have, <laughs> Um, it's hard to identify them. You've got a lot of James Kelly's from New York. Uh, you want to really know before you fork out that money to order a huge pension file, because I believe the cost running cost is still like $80 for a pension file. So before you fork out that money, you want to make sure you got the right guy. Um, with these records here, you're, you're going to be able to get more information to identify them. And it's going to give you the information about their military affiliation. So here we can see the company, the name of the regiment or vessel that they were serving on, date of enlistment, discharge. So matching that up to what's on the pension index is going to help you ensure that you have the right person. And this is just the top part of this record that we're looking at here. And, and this is another important tip, too. Whenever you're looking at a record, make sure you look at the entire page. Uh, a lot of times you'll find notes at the bottom, and sometimes the notes are like the best part of the page. <laughs> you never know what whoever that record keeper decided was important enough to make note of at the bottom. But also in this case, um, the bottom portion of this same page, this is what you have. And you've got their post office address, which helps make them identifiable. So if I'm looking for John Rudolph and I know my guy lived on Fifth Avenue, I'm going to, you know, this is going to give me a pretty good idea that I've got the right guy. 
But you've also got, again, the notes, the disability incurred in the remarks are fantastic. Um, this guy, uh, John Rudolph, he, uh, his disability was parotic effusion. His horse was shot out under him. He had three ribs broken and was discharged for disability. Um, there's all kinds of different things in here. Uh, guy had rheumatism. Um, let's see, uh, this guy here lost his right leg at the Battle of Antietam and he was drawing a pension. Um, so that tells us we need to go look for that pension record, right? Um, another guy here had a gunshot wound in the right arm. He was discharged um, from the hospital at Alexandria. And the last one deserted from the Confederate Army and enlisted at Company E, Captain Holmes Company. So again, all of these details are part of your family story and going through and making sure you're capturing the whole thing. And in addition to just not just scrolling down and looking at all the notes on that page, page forward, page forward, keep going until you're sure you've gotten to the end of that record, because a lot of times you're going to find that there's more to it than what you're seeing right there. Um, we have some state military record collections that are fantastic. Um, the, this is uh, one from Kansas. We have some from New Mexico. We have photographs from California. Really rich details. What Kansas did here, um, the Historical Society went out and reached out to the families of World War I veterans and wanted to know about their, their veterans. Uh, most of them, I believe, were deceased. Um, but you're going to find all kinds of details that were handwritten. This is from uh, on the stationery from the family and their handwritten details from the parents talking about where he was born and, you know, all the different details. And you find some really moving messages in there, too. Um, you know, notes from the mother who just lost their son. Just incredible, incredible family history treasures in here. And I love the photographs. Um, for U.S. records, um, one of the things we have are Siemens Protection Registers and Certificates. Um, uh, there was the problem of, especially in the early 1800s, before the War of 1812, of impressment of U.S. soldiers. So seamen were ordered the, or given these protection certificates to say, hey, I'm a U.S. Um, sailor. You can't take me. <laughs> Uh, but they, they were used for a lot of things. I think a lot of ways they were kind of um, almost a passport. But you can find a lot of important details about the people in these records. This is one of the certificates here. Um, this list includes the fact that he was going to Philadelphia, from Philadelphia to Martinique and back. Uh, it talks about where he was born, gives a physical description. Um, this is for John Brown. Um, he was an African-American man. And he, this record is from 1798. So records for African-Americans can be difficult to find from this era. So these are real treasures. Um, and a lot of times you're going to find African-American, especially free men of color, they found work as sailors. So especially up in the North, um, Massachusetts, you know, all the different uh, sailing areas up there. So something to think about. Um, this is also, this is actually a web database. And I wanted to point this out. What we've done is gone out and with, for websites like the National Park Service, we've gone out and gotten some of the information from theirs and we will send you to their website for more information. So you can click here and go through and see what records the National Park Service has in this actual index. And sometimes they will have a little bit more than what we've captured here. But you can see that even with just we had what we have here, there's some pretty decent information there. These are among my favorite records. I have a lot of city people um, and U.S. city directories are fantastic because urban residents tended to move a lot. Um, they tended to be renters and uh, a lot of times when the leases expired, they would get a pick up and move and find another place. So you see them moving from place to place. A lot of times it's within the same community, but especially when you're tracking people, knowing their address in a city is really helpful. Um, even if you don't have city ancestors, if you, you know, a lot of people say, oh, my ancestors live in the country, there won't be a directory for them. Look for a county directory. But not only that, look at the, the town or the county seat, look for the county seat for the county that they lived in. A lot of times you'll find that the county seat will include that town and then also the surrounding smaller communities. So you're going to find a lot of 
people in rural areas in some of these directories as well. So don't overlook them. Um, but again, tracing them and also looking to see, you know, what people with the same name lived at the same address. You can start piecing together families, whether, you know, you're going to have to do a lot more research to figure what the exact relationships are. But a lot of times you'll find, you know, grown sons living in the same household with their parents and they're now up and working. So they're appearing in the directory and you'll see multiple people with that same address. And so you wanna group them together, figure out what the relationships are, but it's a great way to help piece together the family. Also remember that these were the guide to your ancestors' neighborhood. Um, that's what the, why these were created. They wanted to let people know, you know, who was available for this type of work and, you know, who was in this business. And, you know, if I needed to go find a grocery store, who's what grocery stores were in the area. So you can really learn a lot about the neighborhoods by looking at these listings. And a lot of times you'll even find historical information at the front. Um, this is from an Indianapolis directory, and it talks about the preparations they were making for the Civil War. Um, as the soldiers were getting ready to go off to fight, you know, and flags were everywhere displayed and the fife and drums were heard at every corner. So there was this, you, you get a sense of, you know, what was, you know, what was happening as they were sending these troops off to the Civil War. Um, this is another one from, this is from Nashville, Tennessee, and it talks about, uh, it's from 1860, it talks about all the different businesses and it talks about the histories of the businesses, what kind of machinery they had available. If this was your ancestor's foundry and machine shop, having these type of details about it is fantastic, right? Um, and in this case over here, you've got a, a, even got an image of, a, of this facility here. So you, you never know what you're gonna find in these directories. Another thing that's really how I find really helpful are the street directories when you're looking in cities. So if I'm looking at my ancestor at 117 Tillery, well, I wanna see where that is on a map in 1860 when they lived there. So I can look at the street directory at the beginning and it'll tell me what streets are, you know, 117 is gonna fall between these two streets. Now I can pick it out on a map. I can look at what churches are in the area. I can look at the cemeteries in the area and figure out, you know, where else in that place, that community, I'm gonna be able to find more records on my people. Um, you are also gonna find uh, a list of churches. You know, how do you know what churches are, were available in the area? What cemeteries were available in the, uh, in the area? Um, you can go in and look and see a list of all the different churches. A lot of times you'll find ethnicities re uh, related to them. In this case, you have the churches that are for colored people, it says. So you're gonna find a lot of things. Sometimes you'll find the Swedish church or the German church. And those are, that's important to remember too, because remember your ancestors probably wanted to go worship with people, you know, of a similar background, you know, so they, they, they're going to go into, they may have traveled further to go to the German church than maybe the Lutheran church that was on the corner near them that was more Swedish. So that's something to consider as well. Knowing what's available, knowing what was there when your ancestors were there, as opposed to what's there now is super helpful. And here you've got on the other side of the page, you see um, the different fraternal organizations. If your ancestor was an active member, maybe one of the officers, you may find them listed by name in here. So a lot of information, and then that could lead you to more, more records as well if you go seek out the records of that organization. U.S. school yearbooks are a lot of fun. This is actually my aunt, my grandmother's sister, Sophie. Love to be able to see, like, especially on the senior class pictures, what exactly they were doing in high school. She was in the typist, she was on the executive board, sponsors, scarab, I don't know what that is, or peppergrand. I need to look both of those up. But she also took a commercial course. But all the different things that um, your ancestors did, this is one of my favorite. <laughs> this is for Rosemary Blood. It gives her birth date all the different activities she was involved in, but her quote, why must the devil have all the good times? <laughs> You're like, okay, Rosemary, go. But um, it also has her senior characteristics. Um, Rosemary Blood, her theme song was I Love Gardenias. Uh, what she does is go out with sailors. What she wants is more sailors. And what she gets is a chemistry professor. So you get some really fun things in here. And a lot of times you'll find autographs of people too. A friend of my, a colleague of mine at work, 
uh, the yearbook on ancestry was actually signed by her grandfather. When he, she goes to his picture in there, he signed it for whoever the person whose yearbook that happened to have been. So you never know what you're going to find in these books, but there, there's, we have a huge, huge collection of them and we're continuing to add to that collection as well. We have some fantastic collections for African-Americans. And we'll take a look at some of these specific ones. Um, probably the most common one that you hear about are the 1850 and 1860 slave schedules. Thing to remember, most often the slaves were not listed by name. If the, one of the exceptions that you may find though is um, for slaves that were 100 years or older, a lot of times you will find them named. So now granted, you're probably not gonna find them in 1870, but at the same time, having that name there is really helpful and important. Um, otherwise, you're just going to find a tick mark, an age, um, a sex, and color. So that's typical. But there are exceptions. Um, you're going to find out, uh, a lot of times you'll find different things. Um, hired out slaves. You may find that they list the employer, like this one here. You've got, you know, that they were, this is who they were hired out to and that, or this was the owner and this is who they were hired out to. Um, some, in this case, some of the slaves were being hired out. Uh, Dr. Rowe was um, hiring convicts from the penitentiary and he was using them as slave labor. Um, oh, also over here, Henry Smith's slaves were being held in trust. What does that tell us? We want to look for a probate because that could include more information on the African-Americans he held as slaves. Um, Freedman's Bank records are another unique collection on ancestry. The Freedman's Bank was incorporated in 18, March 1865. There were 37 branches, but only 29 of those bank's records were preserved. Um, they were in 17 states. Over the lifetime of the bank, there was like over 70,000 depositors. Um, unfortunately, uh, the bank closed in 1874 as a result of mismanagement, fraud. Um, a lot of people lost all of their savings in this bank. But the cards continue to give to us. Um, the ones, this is one from pretty close after slavery. In this case, you're going to find, you may find the name of the master, mistress, and plantation. Um, later ones will not include that information, but this one's from 1866, so it does. But um, you can go in and see these, these cards and um, bank records in general. The, the really cool thing about them is back then you couldn't just go slap your eyes, you know, show them your state ID or your driver's license. You had to prove who you were to the bank before you could go withdraw funds or do anything with your, your money. So they would grab personal information that presumably only you would know. So you can see here, in, in addition to the plantation information, you've got a description, you've got the wife's name, name of children. This gentleman served in the US colored troops. So it gives that his regiment and company, place of birth, residence, occupation, and then the remarks, it gives his father was Ben, he was freeborn, his mother was Betsy Stewart, brothers, names all of his siblings. So really great information here um, on Ward Markham, and you'll find this on a lot of African Americans that uh, put their money in the Freedmen's Bank. Again, the later ones aren't going to give quite as much, but you're still going to find these remarks. You just never know what you're going to get on these records. So always worth a look-see. <clears throat> uh, the Southern Claims Commission, um, and then there are some of the files from them as well. There's an index. Um, we've updated this and added the name of witnesses. Uh, there's, these are claims that could be filed at Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, and West Virginia. Um, in 1871, they created the Southern Claims Commission. It was an organization so that Southerners, both white and African-American, filed claims for reimbursement of any personal property they lost due to the Civil War. But they had to prove the, the loss of the property. They had to prove that they had supported the Union and not supported the Confederacy. Um, they had to submit claims um, to the government. And there was, there's, you'll find a lot of times a lot of correspondence in there. 
Um, but you also, in addition to individuals, you may find churches, businesses, and other institutions sub uh, submitting claims. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. It's for a gentleman named Fergus Wilson. Um, his property was taken by Sherman's army a few days before Christmas in 1864. <clears throat> I'll read you a little excerpt from this. It says, my name is Fergus Wilson. I was born in Savannah. I'm 70 years old. I live at Elliott's Bluff, Camden, Georgia. My business is a farmer. I am the claimant. I resided from April 1st, 1861 to the 1st of June, 1865 in Savannah. And he was working in a hospital as an attendant. He was in the capacity of a servant. I did not change my residence during this time. Um, and this is part of the really cool part of this one. Um, it says, I concealed union prisoners and I fed them during the war. Me and my wife took care of them till they got better. I did this at different times. I carried baskets and threw them into the union prisoners three and four times a day. What happened was um, the railroad that was taking uh, union prisoners to the prison camps ran nearby where he lived. And so the family would go and they would throw baskets of food up to the prisoners that were passing by on the trains. But he says, I, would ra I had rather suffer death than to see them open their mouths and we not fill it. The cars passed along near where I lived, filled with union prisoners. I ran and landed, handed over baskets full in the cars, spiked the guard. The women would run and tumble over with the guard after them, but they would be sure and get the bread in the cars. I encouraged them to do this and they were better than the men. We did not call them union prisoners. We called them our men. So here again, you get the real story. They include, the, the, in, in addition to that, it gives the name of his former owner, um, the fact that he was given a plot of land to work. Um, he had been sold to the railroad, worked in the railroad hospital, and then he'd come home and, at the end of the day and work his land. And during the day, he had other people he would hire. Um, he hired men to work the fields, and then he hired women to take his produce to the market and did pretty well for himself. I've actually done a little bit of research on him. But it's really, I mean, again, you, the stories that you find hidden in these records, but you really got to go out and look for them. You've got to read the records. And you'll find some amazing things in here. Um, to search the Southern Claims Commission, um, you could go through and look at the allowed claims. And the, there's three different collections. There's an index, there are the allowed claims, and then the disallowed and barred claims. You could go through and search or browse through the allowed and disallowed because they are alphabetical. Um, an easy way to do it is go through the index. And you can go through here and you'll see this is one that was disallowed, this was barred, this one was allowed, there's Fergus here. So his claim was allowed, although they didn't. They only paid him like less than half of what he had been asking for. And his story is really kind of fantastic too when you read through the entire file. Um, despite the fact that the Union Army, Sherman's Army came in and the day before Christmas wiped the family out. They took everything. They took all of their, their livestock. They took all of the produce that they had on hand. The, they actually took the pot of breakfast that was cooking on the stove and brought it to the camp, which was within sight of Fergus's doorstep. He could see them eating all of his food. So you would think that this gentleman would be really bitter in fact, he encouraged his son to go out and join the U.S. Colored Troops. So um, he's he's kind of a remarkable man from what I've read about him. I'm still researching that uh, case, but really interesting stuff in there. And you get some really incredible insights. One thing to bear in mind, too, those they're also pursuing a claim. So there's a motive there for them to maybe embellish a little bit. But I know this story seems to be a little bit too detailed and it kind of feels to be like there's there's at least some truth into it. Um, we have records of the U.S. Colored Troops, their military service records. Um, this is the initial card that's going to give you all the different pieces of information. The United National Archives has grabbed records from that they have and extracted uh, the information on these cards. And these are all the different card numbers. Um, this one's for a gentleman named Hardin Harrigan, and you can see here that he died of disease, um, but it, he gives here, it says his name, uh, it says James Harrigan, supposed to be the name of the owner. 
but he also says down here added May 1948. So again, here we want to look at that evidence and go, okay, this was added way after 1864. So that's something that we're going to want to investigate, but super clue here. But again, the information, your organization he was affiliated with, where he was born, his age, when enlisted, where enlisted, the period, um, a description, um, buster dates, all kinds of information, um, and then credited, we're credited. This is okay, the fourth district. Um, so this is where he was credited as serving his different areas, different jurisdictions were required to raise a certain number of troops. So he was credited to the fourth district in Kentucky. Um, US Register of Colored Troop deaths during the Civil War. There's another interesting one. The really sad thing here is when you look at it and see how many of them died of disease. Um, to me, you know, that's really sad. I mean, it's not any sadder than having to die on the battlefield, but to me, it, it seems like they're like not as necessary if they would have been able, but they're just, they just didn't have the wherewithal to take care of people as well as we would like to have seen. But so many people in the Civil War, both African American and white, died of disease, but it was a lot more prevalent among the African Americans. So, um, Freedmen's Bureau records are fantastic. Um, if you want a, a really good overview, the Family Search Wiki has a good overview of these. There's, um, they're not all indexed. Um, we have a collection, Family Search has a collection. There is a lot of overlap, but from what I've seen, there is some difference as well. So you may wanna try and check both places. Um, even if they're not indexed, look at the different volumes. Um, you can go through and use the browse to get to different places. This one here, when I go into the complaints registered 1866, there's an actual index to the surnames. So for example, if I'm looking for Meyer Coleman here, I can see that he's on page 186 and I can go in then and browse to page 186 and then here's his record here. So you can go in, even if it's not indexed or maybe somebody was misindexed or mistranscribed and you're not finding someone, go in and check out these indexes that are built into the actual collection and use those to see if you can find them manually. I do the same thing with probates too, because a lot of times you're going to find stuff that was missed, uh, but may show up in that index. Um, we have the descriptive list of colored um, volunteer army soldiers from Kentucky. This is just 1864, but some really cool information in here. Talks about you know, where they were born, their occupation, enlistment, um, again, the affiliation, when they were mustered into service, and the notes. These are these are the really fantastic thing. This is where a lot of times it's where they were credited to, but a lot of times you'll find some additional information in there too. But here, name of owner of a slave. So great information in these records. You got to go dig for these records though too. Um, we have Washington D.C. slave emancipation records. But it's not just emancipation. There are um, some other records that are involved in this as well. You can go through and browse this collection. Um, you'll find all kinds of things. Um, what happened in DC was in 1862, legislation would, uh, was signed that allowed people to be compensated $300 for um, if they would emancipate their slaves in Washington, DC. So if they were loyal to the union, they were eligible for this. In July, uh, apparently a lot of the owners were not complying. So in July of that same year, uh, they passed further legislation that said, okay, even if the owner doesn't come in to court and emancipate them, the slave themselves can come in and petition for their own freedom. So you're gonna find a lot of different types of records in here. Um, this is one having to claim to service or labor having refused to file in your office. So this is someone whose owner refused to file. So they're appearing on their own. This is Rosetta Garrett. So um, look for those type of records. Um, Alfred Cook was a free person of color. He purchased his own son. So he was trying to keep his son safe. But this is an affidavit from his family. Apparently Alfred had died 
And he said he had never intended to keep him as a slave, but his brothers and sisters were petitioning in 1859 to have him freed for the sum of $1 that was paid to them. And so you'll find a lot of different interesting records like this in there. I've seen a few of them. Um, I don't know if, if some of you have seen, um, we did a movie called, a little short film for Sundance called Railroad Ties. Um, and, and it talks about, it referenced the Weems family and their record in there, uh, J, uh, the father of the family went out and purchased a lot of his children's freedom. So you can go out there and see one of, at least one of his children, him out there emancipating one of his children. This collection also includes records of fugitive slave cases. So you may find some records, like this is one from 1856, where it says that Mary Ann Williams has escaped from her owner, Mary Massey of Virginia, and that she's, they think she has fled the state. And so she's petitioning the court you know, to see if they can have her brought back. Um, sometimes you're going to find how the slave came into the owner's possession. This is one for Elizabeth Stutley and it says she inherited it from her grandmother, Mrs. Breckenborough. So you could go through and it's by her last will and testament. So it says a copy of which is her into a, a appended that may or may not be in the file, but it also alerts you to go look for that pension record because there could be a lot more detail there. Savannah, Georgia. These are registers of free persons, and you'll find these in other locations as well. I'm trying to hurry a little bit because I think I'm running a little bit behind. Um, but an 1839 city ordinance required that owners of slaves and guardians of free persons of color had to register. So they'd have to go get a badge from the clerk of the council before they could be hired out or before they could, um, like if somebody would have to go get this um, permit before they could permit their charges to be employed. Um, also, all free persons of color, 16 of age, um, and then it was lowered to 14 in 1854 or older, were able, or they were required to register annually with the clerk. Um, and otherwise, they, were, they, uh, you could have, you, they could be removed from the city. Uh, by state law, all free persons of color were between 18 and, or between 15 and 60 were liable for public service. So they also had to serve up to 20 days a year. If a person of color entered and remained in the state and failed to register, they faced arrest, trial, and a fine of $100 and or labor as punishment. So um, these are, look at the descriptions. Again, all this information comes from the descriptions of these Georgia records. And you want to look, on, again, on the, the local level, look on the state level, because a lot of Southern states had similar legislation like this. And so you may find records that are similar to these from Savannah. We also have, uh, lastly, a collection of um, a U.S. African-American newspapers, Frederick, Frederick Douglass's newspapers included among them, but there are some from different locations, one's from Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, the Columbus Standard from Ohio. So you're going to find them from different parts of the country. Um, they range from 1829 to 1947. These, uh, remember, these newspapers are ocr so they were uh, indexed by a computer, so that may not be perfect, but really fantastic resources for browsing and getting some historical context. Um, we have some special collections, uh, and as far as special collections, we already talked about the Jewish collection and the Quaker collection. We, we also have a collection of American Indian records, and that's, um, again, we have the guide here, um, if you scroll down on this page, it's going to give you a list of all the collections, all the included data collections here. So like each specific database that's included in this, and it's a pretty extensive list. Um, but again, here's the research guide. And then this is where you, you can hop down to all the collections that are included in that search. So fantastic researches if you have Native American ancestors. And that actually is pretty much it for what I have. So um, Heather, if you're ready for some Q&A. Yes, let me, um, let me bring Rhonda into it. Okay, Rhonda, you should be able to click on your video. There, hey, it worked, hey. I love when it works. 
Um, thank you so much. This was, this was awesome. Um, we have some great questions. I do want to point out real quickly that the Central Arkansas Library System has Ancestry Library Edition available to our card holders and you can get it from home right now through the end of this month, through March 31st. But you need to email info at cows.org um, to get the password to be able to use it from home. The difference that I've been, and Juliana, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the difference that I can tell between a subscribed um, program where you pay for Ancestry and the library edition is that people cannot create, with the library edition, they cannot create family trees and they can't participate in discussion boards. They can look at family trees and they can look at discussion boards, but they can't actually participate in them. And so we had a question from somebody who apparently is a, a subscribing Ancestry person right now and wanted to switch to using just the library edition. And it's my understanding that she would lose her information if she lets her account, her paid account lapse. But no, she um, needs actually, to okay, you, you are correct in that um, you can't create a tree from an institutional account because it's an institutional account. So there's a bunch of people on that account. So there would be like a ton of trees on there. <laughs> um, but if she has a personal account, even if she doesn't have a paid account, she could still have a registered account. What she would not be able to access, she could access her tree and all the, the personal details, but if she wanted to click through to a record she had attached through Ancestry, she would not be able to access because what you're paying for with your subscription is the, the record, the access to the actual record. She may be able to find, get that access through the institutional account, but it won't be that seamless, you know, I go into my tree and I click through to this census record that's attached to this person. She'd have to go out and, but based on what she has, she may be able to, you know, pretty easily go back and re relocate that record. Um, the other thing too, with the institutional accounts, there are some collections that are available on Ancestry that are not available due to contractual obligations. When we, when we work with content providers, you know, the, depending on the contract, some of them, you know, are fine with us, you know, putting in our institutional account. Some of them are not. So depending on the contract, um, some of the local histories, um, I didn't really get into them a lot. Or I didn't get a, get a chance to get into them because I had to edit myself <laughs> a little bit. Um, but uh, once you get into those institutional accounts um, or the local histories, you're going to maybe find that they aren't available on the institutional where they are on Ancestry. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. There are some other ones, um, some kind of isolated ones, but for the most part, the big collections, the census, that type of thing, you're going to be able to get on the institution as well as your Ancestry account. And again, you will, even if your subscription lapses, you still have access to your, the basics of your tree. You can still print out your pedigree chart and all that type of thing and look and see all the relationships and you can still build on the tree too. It's just, um, you won't have that easy click through access. Okay, I'm searching for ancestry and now I can attach this record to my tree because I found it. You're not gonna be able to access that record itself because that's what rec the subscription requires. Cool, thank you. Um, so Hank Klein says, I noticed you have some Zook relatives who lived in the west side of Cleveland, Ohio. He has some Zook relatives who still live in Cleveland, Ohio. So it's all good. Yeah, actually it's it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Zook says um, where I live in the Chicago area is it's a very, really rare name. I've run across one person who had the same name, the same surname as I did. <clears throat> but in Cleveland there's a higher Hungarian population. It's a Hungarian surname. And actually in Hungary, um there's a website that lists the different surnames and the popularity. And I want to say it's like 16th most common name in Hungary. So in places where you've got a yeah, high same. population of Hungarians, yeah. like you do in Ohio and Cleveland, um, you're going to see a lot more soups than you would here. <laughs> yeah. Same thing with the Benden in Sweden, where it's a real popular name in Sweden. There's three of us in Arkansas. So. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all in but kind of makes it easy too. 
Um, <laughs> you get those great personalized email addresses because nobody else has Rhonda a name. <laughs> right. Unlike Rhonda Stewart, there's other Rhonda Stewarts. Yeah. At least three in the city. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm the original. Um, That's okay. right. You are the original, Rhonda. <laughs> yes, you are the original. Um, so Ann Lewis says, how often were the non-population schedule schedules published? Um, they were published every 10 years. The ones that are available are between 1850 and 1880. Um, so those are the ones that you're going to find on Ancestry. I believe there are a couple selected states. There might be some from 1885 as well. And, and Sherry Rosa, so this was about, <laughs> this was early in your presentation. She says, I've never seen these particular schedules in Ancestry. Where do I go to pull these particular, these ones up in particular? What I would do is go to the card um, catalog. And that if you go to that search tab, um, the card catalog is one of the things there. And I just remember that non-population schedules is what they're called on Ancestry. So what I do is I put non-population in the title, and that's really the only collection that'll come up with that in a title. Um, if you, when you search the card catalog, okay. and I thought I had a slide in there for that too. I was trying to edit because I knew I had way too much in here, um, and I must have accidentally deleted that. But when you search the card catalog, when you're searching the title field, the words or the term that you put in that title field has to appear in the actual title of the database. So if you know the title like non-population or mortality schedules, I'll just type mortality. And there's not a lot of databases that come up with mortality. So that's a quick way to bring up one if you know the title. If you're looking for a keyword, um, like for example, I use the example of uh, Brooklyn a lot. Um, there are a lot of collections that relate to Brooklyn but don't have Brooklyn in the title. Um, there because Brooklyn became a part of New York City. So there's like some Brook, or New York vital records. So if you put it in keyword, what that does is it search not just the title, but it's also going to search the description. So it's going to say, okay, I'm looking for Brooklyn. And then when I look at the description, it says includes records for Brooklyn, blah, 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 even though the title of it is New York, New York vital records or whatever the exact title is. So um, you're going to get a broader search if you search keyword. There are also filters along the side. And if you want, I could pull up and show you here. This is where you would get to the card catalog. Sorry, I search. That's on that, not my tree. Come on. My mouse is being <laughs> wonky today. But see, there, here's your title search. And see this, I, if I search for Wyoming, it would pull up that because Wyoming's in the name. But here's where you would put keyword, but you also have these filters by category. So if I was looking for vital records, maybe I want to see what birth records are available for Arkansas. And so I can go in and say, okay, here's birth. And then I can click on Arkansas. And you can see we've got Arkansas birth certificates, 1914, 1917. And you're going to see a lot of other lists. Um, when I'm looking for vital records, though, I tend to go to that map because I think it's kind of a cleaner experience. Um, here's where you would go in, like I showed you before, and then you would click on the vital records. And then here's all the birth, marriage, and death records we have for Arkansas. So, and again, check on the county level as well. You may find stuff in here that you're not going to find other places. Um, sometimes they're newspapers. Here you've got Washington County, Arkansas marriage records, 1845 to 1941 on the county level. So you want to look both state and county because you don't know, you know, what's available. And knowing what's available on Ancestry is really key because you can search till the cows come home for that birth record. But if we don't have it, <laughs> you're not gonna, so knowing what's there and then also keeping up too. When I look at the card catalog. Come on. I can go and hover over this and it's going to tell me when, um, what, uh, when this database was published. It was published in August of 2020 and it was updated same date because sometimes we'll go back and you'll find that updated date is more recent. 
So it gives kind of a clue that you might want to go back and revisit that if you haven't been there in a while, because we may have added new records that have become available or done something that tweaked or re-indexed some things that is going to make it easier for you to find your people on there. So it's always good to kind of keep up this way with the card catalog and know what's new. And you can even sort by date added. So like the newest records right now are showing up at the top, whereas the older records will show up at the bottom. And you can sort by the title, um, date updated, or record count. So you can pick all the biggest ones on top. <laughs> So Robert Lindley says that he clicked on Illinois on the map in all collections, which brings up counties in narrow by region. However, a number of counties on this list show temporary, un temporary unavailable. Um, is he doing something wrong? He says. He, um, he was, he's saying temporarily unavailable. Is it like an error type of thing? It's hard to say. Okay. It shouldn't, they, if it's coming up, try, if you come up with like any kind of error saying, I, I can't get this right now, try hitting refresh. A lot of times, you know, you get that little glitch and then it just, you hit refresh and it comes right up. Um, if they, if that's not the case, um, oh, you'd have to send, send me an email to my personal email, julianazooks at comcast.net. Um, if that's not the case and it's not just something that a refresh is going to carry over, you could, if you could send me a link to that, I can pass that on to people in the office and they could check that out for you. Okay. Um, we've got some, we've got some compliments, excellent program, but, um, this is being recorded and live streamed to YouTube. And so you'll be able to, there is no handout for this. I know in the past we've done a handout, but, um, the recording is your handout. <laughs> um, so what, what are the dates of the, oh, that's for me. So future quarterly workshops, we're, we're working on that. So hopefully June or July. Um, Mary Evans says she heard ex that Ancestry extended the remote through April. I haven't heard that yet, Mary, but often you know things. Rhonda, have you heard that? I haven't heard. I haven't heard. Okay. Yeah, I'm Mary not aware knows. of that, um, but yeah. it's, it's quite possible though. We oh, usually, so. they are... Um, Go ahead, Ron. I just said, let's hope so. It's been yeah, productive. Let's hope so. It's been productive. Uh -huh. yeah. It has been. Um, is what you can access different from what I have on my paid account? In other words, do you have more? I think we've already answered that. No, yeah, I think we talked about there. There are a few collections on the paid account. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure the number of them. Um, or what exactly they are. Again, it, it depends on the contractual agreement that we have. Um, any collections that are from the National Archives, for example, those should be available on your institutional account. Yes, yes. Um, yes, this is being recorded. And so when you get your follow-up email, which will include a survey um, to tell us how wonderful we are or what you'd like us to change, um, either way, um, you will also get the link to the reporting in there as well. Um, you can access Ancestry through CALS. You just need to email info at cals.org and I will type that in the chat. Um, they will check your account and you'll, you'll give them your name and your library card number and they will check your account and then they will send you the information on how to get the remote access. You can also come into any of our 15 branches and use it from a branch computer um, there in, in the branches. Um, are there lots of English records, Bristol, Shropshire? Yes. Uh, yeah, we have a very good UK collection. I can't speak specifically to Bristol or Shropshire, um, but if you go to that same search tab, you can go through and when you click on UK and Ireland, you could click on England, and then you can go in through like, for example, here's Shropshire. We have, this is what we have for Shropshire. We've got some parish records, um, not really a ton there. There's some directories, uh, Church of England parish records. Um, so yeah, Shropshire is a little bit lean. There's some um, stories, memories, and histories. And this is one I didn't talk about, 
these are the collections that don't surface well, both U.S. and anywhere, really, um, because they're typically books that have been OCR'd. Um, so they're not those nice, neat columns that databases like. But again, when you're looking for that contextual history, I treat these like a book on my shelf. A lot of times you can browse through chapter by chapter and see what's in them. But fantastic information, stuff that's available on a local level. The, the things that you're not going to get in your history books are the kinds of things that you can find in these small local histories. Fantastic information. But again, you got to go digging for them. Glenn Whaley, who is the manager of the Roberts Library and our boss, um, says that we got word in an email on February 24th, which I guess Rhonda and I both missed. We don't have time for email. <laughs> <laughs> that Ancestry is good through June 30th. So thanks for letting us know that, Glenn. Yeah. <laughs> good for me to know, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, we don't have time for email. We answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that I noticed while you we were talking is in those military records, the cool thing that I found on mine, I, I always tell people, I didn't do a lot of my personal genealogy. I, I was busy doing genealogy of the woman I wrote my master's thesis on. And so just recently I've started doing my own personal genealogy and, you know, my grandfather, he was gray headed by the time I knew him. Right. And so I had no, and black and white photos. You can't really tell really what hair color is. Um, and in his draft card for world war two, he is marked as blonde and he doesn't really look blonde in a lot of the pictures, but so I always think that, I mean, that's that extra level of, of detail that you don't, that you don't get just in the census. Mm -hmm. That's very true. And uh, sometimes too, you can kind of compare, uh, you know, if you've got another record with this, some kind of description on it, or if you're looking at a photograph and trying to identify someone in a photograph, sometimes those physical descriptions can help you with that. Yes. Um, let's see we, what process to get information all my family records are she moved she moved four years ago what process to get information all my family records are there from 1800 to 2016 when i moved why don't you call us or Rhonda? Cause I'm on vacation after this. So why don't you call um, the Butler center? I'll put the phone number in the chat and we can get some more information, Diane, about, about your records. Um, the city directories are right there in ancestry. Um, we also have them available in the Roberts library research room. If, if you want to um, look at them, not on a digital screen. Um, city directories are awesome. I yeah, mean, they just it's one of the things I didn't mention when we we're looking at the city directories is what I like to do because I mean, a lot of times we have a pretty good run, especially for larger cities between like 1860s and like, especially like 1930s. And then we started really grabbing a lot what before the 1940 census launched to help people, you know, use addresses to help find their people. But um, it, go through the browse up in the upper right corner. You'll see a little browse thing. What I like to do is before I start my search, I want to look and see what directories are available. Maybe I, if I'm looking, for example, I was looking for one from 1880 the other day and they didn't have 1880, but they had 1878. So I focused my search around the 1878 directory, knowing that that was what's available as opposed to trying to say, okay, I want to see this guy in 1880 when we don't even have that one. So again, we have pretty good runs for a lot of places, but knowing what's there, go in and look at the state, the city, and then what years are available, and you can formulate your search a lot easier. Yes, and to clarify something, um, Ann Lewis asked us to clarify about Ancestry only available until June 30th. That is simply the remote access for the library edition for CALS patrons. And so since the pandemic started, before the pandemic, there was no remote access for Ancestry Library Edition. You had to come into the library and Ancestry has um, continued to extend the remote access as the pandemic continues. So right now we have till June 30th, but it's 
it's it's moved like it's been a moving target like every every month Ron and I are talking about it like are they going to extend it so so now till June 30th that is just the library edition that doesn't affect any personal accounts any subscriptions to Ancestry I don't want anybody to to misunderstand me on that so um and yes the access remote access to Ancestry to get that information, you do type info at cows.org that goes to the main library and they're gonna check your library card. Um, but if you wanna ask questions about genealogy or get in touch with Rhonda or any of our other genealogists, it's arcinfo at cows.org and I clarified that in the chat. Any other questions, Rhonda? I am excited. I'm thankful for you, Juliana, because I always oh, learn you. so much from you. And uh, you reconfirm that I am processing the materials in a way that <laughs> would make it beneficial to the people I'm talking to. So thank you for- uh, Oh, thank uh, you for inviting me back. I love, yeah. I, I, I wish I could be there in person again, but hopefully soon. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna do this again in person, God willing, we will. <laughs> And do you want to talk just briefly about the 1950 census? Um, I, I really don't, I can't really tell you much other than we will be on it <laughs> as soon as that thing is available. Ancestry will be there with going, please. <laughs> so we will be getting it out there as quickly as we can. Um, I really don't have any details on the release and release dates. We're still a little bit out on that. Um, but yeah, we should probably be starting our countdown calendar now, right? <laughs> right. And uh, all those volunteers that helped with the 1940 census, bring back, come back, bring a friend, and we're going to get this done. <laughs> yep. Yep. I mean, it, it's exciting for people. I mean, I'm 46 and my parents will finally show up on a census, right? You right. know, so. Yeah, this um, is the first one I'll be able to see my mom on. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, we've got a, just a, two more questions and they're kind of they're kind of important. So I wanted to get those real quick. Um, Sherry is doing she's searching records in the Azores and she says, um, any advice researching records in another language? They're um, in Portuguese. Yeah, it's hard. Um, one of the things and I'm not familiar with Portuguese or Azores records, but um, so I'm not sure you know, what style they're in. If I found, because I'm searching for like Hungarian records in some cases and some Polish records, um, a lot of cases you're going to find like, like with the Hamburg passenger list, even and a lot of the German records, if they have those columns at the top or, you know, the, if, if they're formatted in a way where you can interpret the columns, a lot of times it's really easy. I've been able to get by with Google Translate and, you know, different word lists. Family Search has some great word lists that use commonly, um, include commonly used terms that are found on records. So it'll translate those for you. And what I'll do is I'll like print out a header and write in what this is. And once you figure out what each column is, then it's just like, okay, this is the occupation. I need to Google Translate what that word means. You know, is he a farmer or what does he do? Um, so they are, it is possible to do it. Um, I would also look for some special interest groups on Facebook or whatever and social media, because a lot of times you're going to find people out there that are just, you know, really willing to help. But Ancestry has a really vibrant social community. Um, you could go to our Facebook page and throw out a question there and ask if somebody can help you verify, did I interpret this correctly? Um, in what did this mean? And there may be, you know, some different things. Again, look at those descriptions too, though, because a lot of times you're going to find some helpful information in there that's going to help you um, not just, just, you know, translate the records, but also interpret, you know, the purpose of the record, why was it created, that type of information that's all important when it comes to analysis. Judy Goss asks, what if you find um, a fact in if, let me just read it. If you find a fact entry is incorrect, like wrong census record, how can you eliminate it from the person's facts? If you, uh, could you re repeat that real quick? If yeah, you, no, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm just like, it was like, I just didn't wrap my head around it. If you find a fact entry is incorrect, 
like wrong, like a wrong census record, how can you eliminate it from the person's facts? So oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So if like, if you accidentally attach the wrong census record and you want to get rid of it, if you click on that edit button at the bottom, let me go into one of my trays here. Um, And if it's another person's fact, then you have to contact them, correct? Okay, so I could go in here, like, for example, if I thought this is the wrong one and I want to remove this fact, I just double click on the fact and down here where it says delete, I can delete that. But I also want to look and see, okay, when you click on a record, I love this little line that tells me this is the record that it's, we're talking about. So say I wanted to eliminate this record. Now I could click on this and also eliminate the source because there's also a remove button here. So I've done this a bunch of times like, oh, that wasn't him. And so I'll go through and eliminate the source and eliminate the event from the fact page. You can see here, I really need to update Jaja's page. <laughs> so, but yeah, there's, um, it's pretty simple to get rid of it once you've gotten it. It's just the two places. You want to get rid of the source. You want to get rid of the event. And you can also create custom events too. As, as you go to add a fact, you can go and create your own custom events. Like maybe you found some piece of information of something that happened in 1864 that's not included on a record that you have there. You can add your own fact. If you have an image of that record in your own collection, you could add the image, add that to the gallery, and then attach that to the event. Um, so there are a lot of things, ways you can kind of work around things if you don't have the, if we don't have the record on Ancestry and you're not doing that click and attach type of thing. I find that that timeline is like Thank you. one of the best things. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. We we have more questions. We can't get to all of them. I encourage everybody who didn't get questions answered. Um, it won't be Juliana at our monthly Finding Family Facts, but Rhonda, um, well, it'll actually be me this month. Yeah. <laughs> we will do our best to answer your questions. Um, Rhonda takes takes the May one off. I mean, the April, April. one off. So yeah. it's it's all me. You're going to get this, the second string. Um, I got one thing so to say. So you will receive... Yes. I just wanted to remind everybody, if you do not have a library card with the Cal system, get you a library card. If you haven't updated in a year, check and make sure your library card is valid. <laughs> yes. And you can simply call a branch and they will check it out. Somebody asked here also, what about out of state? Um, if if you are not a Central Arkansas library patron and not a card holder, check with your local library. Most libraries subscribe to Ancestry um, and other genealogical resources. They may not have a genealogy resource center like we do, but they will, they will have, you'll have access. You can still email us and call us. We'll help anybody anywhere, um, but just you can't necessarily access us ancestry unless you physically come into our building and if you're out of state that may be a little hard um but still contact us we may be able to help you answer your questions um so you'll receive a survey tomorrow or in the next couple of days i can't remember when i scheduled it via email to the email address that you registered for this please take a few minutes to complete that and let us know what we're doing um, and also let us know what other kind of programs you'd like to see um, and watch your email also for a date and time of the next genealogy workshop. It'll probably be in June or July. We haven't selected who we're going to um, have come do the talk this time. Rhonda and I have got to get on that. I meant to do it for this, but time got away from me um, as it happened so many times. So thank you, Juliana, so much for doing this. Again, it was great. Um, you always have, I always learned, like Rhonda, I always learned so much. Always learn something, yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you inviting me back. Thanks, everybody.